Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Global Network webinar today. So we are really happy to have four speakers to present on tools and mechanisms to coordinate capacity development. Before our webinar, let me give a quick introduction to our speakers first. So our first speaker is Mr. Stephen Well. Steve is the regional advisor in statistics at UNECE. He has worked there for over 14 years in various angles, including as head of the statistical management and the modernization unit and database coordinator. Our second speaker is Mr. Alexander Lofsky. Alex works in UNSD's uh, statistical capacity management section. He leads the development of global calendar, co-leads the development of global network of data officers and the statistician, and is co-organizer of the UN Brownback and the Global Network webinar series. Our third speaker is Ms. Uh, uh, Juri uh, Yada, who is the coordination lead of the Born Network on financing data for development at Paris 21, where she works with development agencies, national statistical offices, international and multilateral organizations, and other expert institutions to advance the agenda for more and better development data. And our last speaker is Ms. Yulia uh, Schmitz, who is a policy analyst at Paris 21, working on measuring statistical capacity, digital innovation, and financing uh, needs in low- and middle-income countries. So now I would like to mention a couple of things, as always, before I hand over to Ronald, who will also give us a quick introduction about today's webinar. So we will first hear the presentation, and then we will have our Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to post any questions in the meeting chat at any time throughout the, the webinar. During the Q&A session, we can read your questions, or you can also raise your hands to ask the question yourself. So this Global Network webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Global Network of Data Officers and the Statistics at yammer.com slash UNSTATS. We encourage you to join the network if you haven't done so, and uh, we invite you to continue the discussion on the Global Network after the webinar. So now let me hand over to Ronald Jensen, the Chief of Data Innovation and Capacity Branch of the United Nations Statistics Division, a chance to introduce today's webinar. So run out the four series. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Yuxi, for uh, this uh, introduction and overview, and welcome uh, to everyone uh, to this uh, webinar today. Um, yeah, so I'm Ronald Jansen. I'm with the United Nations Statistics Division in New York. Um, we are in we, I'm leading the uh, branch on data innovation and capacity. Um, we have the uh, statistical capacity management section uh, where uh, uh, Alex is uh, working. Uh, so we have this uh, stake in uh, in trying to strengthen and support uh, capacity development. Uh, I just want to be very brief uh, and, and give most of the room to our uh, excellent presenters today. But I wanted to make three points. Um, the first one is the, let's say, the, the overall coordination of um, capacity development uh, within the uh, global statistical system. So what the what our division, what the UN Statistics Division's uh, main purpose is, is serving the um, UN Statistical Commission, uh, where we bring every year uh, all members, uh, all member states uh, together uh, to, to discuss and how to improve uh, official statistics uh, around the globe. And of course, uh, capacity building is, is a large part of that. So the, the, the global uh, uh, structure, the, the overall coordination uh, goes uh, through the uh, Statistical uh, Commission. Uh, you can find uh, the topics um, uh, which are being uh, dealt with uh, every year uh, on our website. And that's a good, good starting point to, to get the overall view of, uh, of uh, how the system works. Now on, uh, on the second point is that we at, at a more closer to home, we work very closely with uh, our our division works very closely with the uh, the regional commission so we work with the commission uh in europe the unece where stephen today will will present 
Uh, we also work closely with the other regional commissions in, in, in Bangkok, ASCAP, uh, in Santiago de Chile, ECLAC, and then in Beirut, uh, we have the ESQA Commission, and then uh, in Addis, uh, our friends uh, of UNECA. We work closely with them. We also have a, 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 a group that uh, regularly uh, meets to uh, discuss the capacity building, so we, we're taking that very seriously, trying also to to align uh, activities and support in that area. And we also work uh, in, in, a, in a, a similar sense uh, very closely with Paris 21. Um, they are um, a, a group um, really devoted to uh, capacity development, uh, strengthening that. Uh, they bring together the, the donors and recipients, and, um, and, and Yure and, and Yulia will, will uh, present on that. Uh, today, we've been working with uh, Paris 21 over the years. Uh, we've recently also uh, trying to see that we, we can support each other uh, in this uh, field. Uh, we're very also, um, for, for those who are interested, of course, uh, please please visit also the, the sites of uh, Paris 21. Uh, their uh, capacity development 4.0, something that we are uh, excited about also to, to work with, with them. Uh, today's session will be on the uh, mechanisms, tools uh, and finances in a sense to strengthen statistical capacity. Uh, I think those elements are very, uh, very important. Uh, brings me to the, the last point is, is the new ways in which we can um, move um, this strengthening uh, support for capacity development forward in a more continuous um, manner. Um, We've done, uh, we've been forced over the last year to do a lot, a lot of things virtual, uh, but part of that I think will also help us in the future to um, have a more continuous way of supporting countries uh, in, um, in building uh, statistical capacity. So I think this webinar in itself is a, uh, a good example of how we bring um, uh, in a virtual way um, information uh, towards a group. Uh, so we have also this new network. I see um, in our uh, audience today already um, people from around uh, the statistical uh, system, and I'm very happy with that. So we're bringing here together both the uh, new networks and a new tool uh, with the vir virtual webinar, and I think those are elements uh, that will help us also going forward uh, once we get back to in-person events I, hope, I think that we will also use the virtual way of, of connecting everyone. So I'll stop here and give, give it back to Yuxi and our, our excellent presenters. And I hope you enjoy uh, the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ronald. So now I think I can hand it over the floor to Stephen. So um, Stephen, the floor is yours. So <clears throat> thank you, Yuxi. And I'll uh, just start uh, sharing my screen. So hopefully that all works OK. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, a relatively new uh, development we have uh, in the UNECE region, uh, something called the Regional Coordination Group on Data and Statistics for Europe and Central Asia. And I noticed uh, just scanning through the participants list that uh, quite a lot of the members of the group are on the call today. So it's uh, great to see uh, so many of them there. And uh, hopefully uh, I don't say anything uh, too wrong about the group, but uh, I'm sure they can add and correct as necessary. So. First of all, why do we have a, a new regional coordination group on data and statistics? Well, the history goes back to uh, the report on the implementation of the review of the UN development system, so uh, a long title. But the UN is basically trying to uh, review and reform the way that it uh, provides uh, development assistance to the countries. And it's all about having uh, closer linkages between the global level, the regional level, and the national level. And as part of that, uh, the UN has strengthened the national level by appointing resident coordinators and creating resident coordinator offices in uh, the various countries. 
But for statistics, maybe the, the key point is the recommendation four on this uh, review of the UN development system, which is all about launching a region by region change management process to consolidate the existing capacities in data and statistics. Now, each UN regional commission had to respond to these recommendations. And our approach in UNECE was to try to create a sort of a regional version of something called the Committee for the Coordination of Statistical Activities, which is a, a group of the heads of all of the international statistical organizations. So we wanted to create a sort of a regional version of that. And that approach uh, got a lot of support at the political level from UNECE's executive committee, uh, which is made up of the ambassadors of all of the member states uh, when we put this proposal to them towards the end of 2019. So we didn't start from absolutely nothing because already in 2018 and 2019, there was a group called a, an issue-based coalition on statistics in the region. And this had already brought together a lot of the regional level players in data and statistics and had started the process of uh, discussion, communication and coordination between those people. So we took that basically and, and built the new structure on top of it. And the new regional coordination group is chaired by UNEP, uh, Thomas Marquez and myself from UNECE. Uh, it reports to the Conference of European Statisticians, which is the annual meeting of the heads of statistical offices for our region. And its main focus is on the coordination of statistical capacity development work in the region. Uh, of course, soon after the group was created in 2020, we went straight into the COVID pandemic. So we've never actually been able to have a physical meeting but we've continued with virtual meetings and the, the group meets about every two to three months. So who are the members of this group? Well, I mentioned that we started uh, based on the previous issue based coalition. So that brought together the regional offices of various UN agencies uh, with uh, activities in data and statistics. So that was the initial group. But we soon realized that if we really want to coordinate capacity development in data and statistics in the region, then we need to bring in the country level. Now, in the UN country teams, uh, starting from last year, we've had the nomination of data and statistics focal points. So we extended the group to bring these people in. And I think that was a very important move because that helps us make the link between the regional and the national levels. Of course, we didn't stop there, though. We've expanded the group again very recently, the start of this year, to include also the relevant non-UN agencies, because if we just have the regional UN bodies, then that's only really half the picture in our region. Uh, we have a lot of very important non-UN bodies uh, for example, Paris 21 uh, on the call today, but also bodies like uh, Eurostat, uh, CESRIC uh, for the uh, Organization of Islamic States, uh, CISstat for many of the uh, Russian speaking countries and various others. So hopefully now with these two expansions of the membership, we have all of the key players in data and statistics in the region. And here's the actual list. Uh, I think there's something like 24, 25 uh, international organizations and the 17 what we call program countries uh, in our region uh, represented by the data and statistics focal points in the resident coordinators office. OK, so a nice new group. Uh, what's it actually doing in practice? So here are some of the outputs that we've produced over the last year or so. Uh, starting with a, a summary of the COVID-19 data activities of the member organizations. So with some help from UNICEF, 
uh, we created a nice dashboard and we shared information about what each organization was doing so that we could uh, try to avoid duplication and maybe find some possibilities for partnerships. We've also been quite busy reporting. Uh, we've reported to the chief statisticians of the UN system, the so-called CCS UN. We've reported to the Conference of European Statisticians and we've reported to something called the Regional Collaboration Platform, which is a sort of management level structure uh, for the UN within the uh, Europe and Central Asia region. We've provided inputs to regional forums on sustainable development, and there have been two of those already in the time our group has been in existence. Uh, we've provided speakers and uh, information for sessions at the forums. We've also provided an input into a report on SDG progress in our region. And I noticed my colleague Andres was uh, also on the call today. He coordinated the production of this uh, UNECE report on progress on SDGs, but through the regional coordination group, we were able to reach out to the country teams and to the regional agencies and get some of the stories behind the numbers. We were able to get, I think, uh, 17 or 18 stories illustrating progress towards the SDG uh, targets in our region. We've also, through this group, been able to get inputs to the forthcoming second edition of the Roadmap on SDG Statistics, which we hope will be endorsed by the Conference of European Statisticians uh, next month. And we've also been able to provide some help, advice and support to some of the country focal points. So these people in the UN country teams uh, are often economists. Uh, some of them don't have a lot of experience in data and statistics, and they've had a lot of questions uh, trying to understand this uh, very complicated picture of the international statistical system and how all of the different activities and actors fit together. So we've been able to try to help them to provide advice and support uh, maybe to suggest speakers for national events, for example, or just to answer questions on activities that are ongoing. But perhaps one of the main outputs and one that will link to Alex's presentation is something we call the Capacity Development Activities Calendar. Now, over the last year or so, we've had uh, a roadmap from the UN uh, Chief Executives Board and we've had a data strategy from the UN Secretary General. And both of those call for regional calendars of statistical capacity development activities. So we've created something within the group and the group members feed in various events and activities that are ongoing. This also helps us uh, with coordination work. Uh, this calendar is public. Uh, the link is on the slides, which will be shared afterwards. Uh, of course, it can be edited by the members of the group. It's relatively easy to filter by country or agency, and it provides a source for the global calendar that Alex will present in a few minutes. Uh, this is just a screenshot showing uh, what you see if you go to the link on the previous slide. Uh, so you can see activities and events uh, by the uh, recipient countries and by the organizing agencies. So just to finish off, uh, what are really the benefits of this approach? Well, I think it's helped to provide support to UN country team focal points. As I mentioned, many of them are not necessarily statisticians. It's helped to better connect the national and the regional level at least, and hopefully that will help us go on to also better bring in the global level. It helps to spread information, and just by spreading information through tools like Calendar, that automatically facilitates partnerships and helps to reduce duplication of activities. It also supports a new sort of triangular cooperation that we're starting to see emerge over the last year. 
And when I say triangular, I mean between the National Statistical Office, the UN country team, and the regional organizations. So it uh, provides this nice sort of uh, triangular approach that we've also been able to use in various uh, capacity development projects over the last year. And I think really to summarize, we can say that the landscape of statistical capacity development is changing. We see a new player emerging, which is the UN country teams. And the challenge is how to integrate them effectively and efficiently into the international statistical community, whilst at the same time trying to improve coordination and to better manage the supply of capacity development activities to the countries. So I think that's more or less what I wanted to present. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your excellent presentation, which is really informative. So now uh, our next speaker is Alexander from the United Nations Statistics Division, who will present us the new global uh, calendar of statistical events. And uh, the, uh, Alexander will also present the current functionalities of the open beta version of the calendar, its coverage, and will uh, shortly uh, expand the technology behind it. In addition, he will talk <coughs> briefly about the global network of data officers and the statistics. So Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Steve, also for linking to the global calendar. Um, let me try to share my screen. I hope you see it. Um, so as Steve has already uh, mentioned, um, to have calendars where all organizations provide information on their events helps to um, coordinate and avoid uh, duplication. Um, the, the calendar which uh, UNECE has mentioned will be one of the sources of the global calendar. This is uh, in, currently in the process of being implemented. But I will come to the sources of the global calendar in a second. So I will be speaking uh, on the calendar and also on the global network uh, of data officers and statisticians very briefly. So what is the global calendar of statistical events? Well, as the name says, it's a, a calendar of statistical events of UN system entities and of other international and regional organizations. The data is collected mostly done uh, by automated web scraping um, techniques. Uh, so the back end of the global calendar is written entirely in Python and scrapes the web pages of the uh, source organizations. In addition to that, uh, we also do data collection, manual data collection for some organizations um, and also some limited uh, manual data entry. The focus of the global calendar is on statistical capacity building events and we also only include for now uh, events which cover a, a group of countries. So we do not include country missions. The reason for that is mainly that the uh, inf pu information available uh, publicly on those country missions uh, varies across organizations. Uh, the global calendar is usually updated once a month. So how is the coverage? Uh, we have currently about 2,700 events listed on the global calendar for the current year 2021 and back to the year 2016. And those events were, uh, the information on those events were extracted from more than 55 uh, um, sources. So you see here a list of those sources. I won't read them out. You can have a look at them now and later when we share um, the, the, the presentation on the global network. 
This is how the calendar looks like when you first access it uh, via the link that you see below. So basically you have two columns. On the left you have a filter box where you can filter uh, the events by various uh, elements. And on the right you have the list of events. Um, as a default view, you will only see the events of the current month. So uh, if you would like to see all events, uh, then in the top left of the filter box, you, you have a button or a tab which is called all events. And when you click on that, then you get the full list of events. And as you see now on the right side, um, we we start uh, we have already some events on the global calendar for the year 2023 and 2022. Um, so, of course, the more you scroll down, the closer you get to the current date. And then, if you scroll even further down, then you will reach also the events of previous years. So. What do you see here? You see for each event you get uh, information on the title, on the um, on the dates when the event is taking place and the place where it is taking place physically if it is an in-person event. You also see information about the source where the data was extracted from and the date when it was extracted. and uh, also, you uh, have some icons. Um, so you have a computer screen icon, which basically shows that, OK, this is an online event. And you have a uh, doctoral hat or academic hat, which indicates this is a capacity building event. Yeah. Then also there is a more button for each event where you click can click on to get more further information about the event. So when you do that, so those are just two examples how this uh, looks like in, in real life. So you have, uh, again, the title, the dates and the source organization, and then you have some additional data items, information items on the events, like a short description, which is extracted at the source if it is available. So the description is available for most sources, but not all. And then you have a classification of the event according to the classification of statistical activities. Um, so in this case, this is an event on uh, merchandise trade. So this is classified under trade and balance of payments. Um, for events where the information originally is in another language than English, we translate it. Uh, so we translate the table, uh, title and you see a small uh, translation icon next to it. So you can see, OK, this is a translated title. If you click on more, then you will get also the original title in this case in French. And the description and then uh, the description for those events which are in other languages are in the original language. So in this case, uh, in French. So um, I have talked of, or I've shown you where you have also this filter box again, clicking on all events will show you the full list. If you uh, go there, clicking on capacity building will only give you the capacity building events and online, of course, only the online events. But you can also filter by a couple of other things like the year when the event takes place, uh, the country where the event, physical event uh, um, took place where the venue is and the region of the venue. So um, there you have to Keep in mind, so if an event takes place, for instance, in Geneva, that doesn't mean that it's only for Europe, but the region will show it's it's an event which takes place in Europe, but the coverage might be um, different. Uh, you can filter by topics. Again, this is by the classification of statistical events and some additional items, and you can filter by the source organization. 
And here I want to point out again, so the source organization basically indicates you where the information on the event was extracted from. That doesn't mean that this organization is also the organizer. It could be the organizer or it could be one of the organizers, but maybe it is uh, not um, having any specific role in the event at all. We plan to add information on the organizers as well, but this is a little bit um, time consuming as we need to collect the information on the organizers um, manually. So on most pages, this is not um, in a format where we can extract it easily. And then you have the possibility to do a free text search uh, and this will search in the title only, so not in the description or other fields. And so just to wrap up on the global calendar, if you want to provide uh, feedback, please do so. This is still a beta service and we will continue to develop this and include more sources as if we can. Um, there's a link at the top to a feedback form, so please use it, give us feedback, and this will guide us in the future development. So now I will very, very briefly, because I think I'm already close to, to my the end of my allotted time, just very briefly on the uh, global network of statisticians and um, sorry, of data officers and statisticians. It's here the um, written in the wrong way. Um, so this is a professional online social community. It was launched in 2020. It's hosted on Yammer, which is a platform by Microsoft, and it has already uh, some 1,500 uh, users. The aim is, again, as, as Steve has also mentioned when he was talking about um, uh, the, the new group that they have formed, uh, so the aim also of this global network is to bring people together to collaborate, to share knowledge, to network, and also uh, for the UN agencies and other organizations to provide technical support to member states. Uh, this slide shows what you can do on the network. I will not go into details here. I just want to say, so the really the theme of the global network uh, can be summarized in just four uh, four words or four short terms. So the global network is all about collaboration, coordination, connection and capacity building. When you have been on already on the global network, you know that there is an all network feed where basically everybody can read and write. And then we have topic specific groups and we already have now created uh, or people, users of the global network have created a number of groups and you see them listed here. And you also see that more um, groups are in the pipelines uh, and will be launched soon. Um, everybody can create groups. Uh, if you want to create a group, please do so but also please get in contact first with Yushi and me and we can help you and support you on that. There are different use cases for, for groups. Um, I have listed them here. Again, I won't read them out, but um, just to mention you can use it uh, to support an expert group or to have um, specific discussions on a topic uh, which you lead. Um, there on the top, there is a link to the training uh, which we had recently on the global network on creating and maintaining groups. And this just leads me to my last slide. So if you haven't joined the global network yet, please do so. Join it today. Here's the link. So it's yammer.com slash unstats. And below in the slide, you also see uh, the link to uh, some information pages which we have at UNSD on the global network. And you can read a little bit more about what the network is about. And that's all for me. So I will hand back now to Yushi. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your um, presentation and introduction for the global calendar of statistical events and the global network. 
So for those of you who haven't uh, joined, so please um, go ahead to, to join our global network and uh, our webinar will be also posted there later after the, the events. So our next speakers are Ju uh, Ray and uh, Julia. They will uh, give us an introduction of their work of the Born Network and its landmark project, the Clearing House for Financing Development Data, a new global platform that will improve information flows to better match the supply and demand for statistical support. And then they will also provide an overview of the platform, its planned functionalities, and the next step ahead of this global launch later in 2021. So, um, to uh, rate the four years. Thank you, Yushi, and hello, everyone. I'm just resharing my slide due to some technical challenges. Here we are. So thank you for the invitation to, to share with you uh, some information on this exciting new project we're working on. It's great to see so many familiar names in the participants list, and I hope we can have a good discussion afterwards. So we'll try to keep this within the allocated time. So as Yushi just mentioned, we're really pleased to tell you more about uh, this landmark project called the Clearinghouse for Financing Development Data, which we are developing to help improve coordination, as the name implies, on development data financing. And just to give you a bit of background before we get started to contextualize the project, the Clearinghouse is being developed by a multi-stakeholder um, alliance, an international group called the Burn Network on Financing Data for Development, which was founded uh, in 2019 by the Swiss government to bring together national statistical offices as well as development agencies and multilateral and international organizations, including, of course, UNSD, which is a core partner and a member of the steering committee, to push forward and make progress on a very important agenda, which is the agenda to achieve more and better funding for development data. And Paris 21 is the secretariat of this network. Now, why the focus on more and better funding for development data? I think many of us already know that there's a critical need to better resource statistical capacity development, in particular in the COVID-19 context, during which many NSOs, especially in low and middle income countries, have seen the demand for data grow in their services, just as there's been a crunch in the budgets, both at the national level and also from external aid, really affecting the implementation of course, statistical activities. So it's in this context and in order to really not only increase the amount of support for data and statistical activities, but also make them more effective and smarter that we've been launching and working on this project called the Clearinghouse, which we are aiming to launch at the upcoming World uh, UN World Data Forum in October. So without further ado, I'd like to start by sharing a short two minute uh, introductory video uh, on the project, and then we'll cover a couple of mockups uh, before moving into a short update on where things stand with the project, including the data sourcing uh, and concluding with some next steps. So let me share the video with you. We all need accurate disaggregated data to achieve the sustainable development goals and leave no one behind. But many countries still lack the means to produce and use high quality data. They need more support. In 2018, global aid for data was only half of what is needed. The COVID-19 pandemic has further threatened progress in data. How can we both increase funding and make it more efficient? Introducing the Clearinghouse for Financing Development Data, the world's first online platform for matching supply and demand of financing for statistics. It provides close to real-time information on aid flows and domestic support to statistics, as well as country demand. This helps to target aid more effectively and strengthen coordination among donors and partners. So how does it work? This is Amir. Amir is helping his ministry budget for SDG monitoring. Thanks to the Clearinghouse, he sees how much aid his country gets and from whom for things like household surveys and censuses. He can also learn how his country's statistical plan matches up against existing funding and international good practices, and how other countries raise and maintain funding for statistics. This is Alice. 
Alice is writing a project proposal to invest in gender data in Latin America. Using the clearinghouse, she can quickly see what other donors are funding to build partnerships or access best practices and identify potential funding opportunities with the biggest impact on women and men in sectors such as health, education, economic livelihoods or COVID-19. She can also see what other donors are funding to identify potential partnerships or access best practices. The Clearinghouse is being developed by the Burn Network, a global alliance to enhance financing for development data. We invite all members of the development and data communities to support the development of the Clearinghouse and help us put data at the heart of the sustainable development goals. By making financing smarter, we can ensure that every dollar for statistical capacity goes further and leaves no one behind. So there we are, that was an overview of the project. And just to highlight a few points from what we just heard in the video, as you can see, the purpose of this project of the Clearinghouse is very much to achieve change by providing timely information and also a community of practice to better match the demand for and the supply of statistical support. So it really harks back to what Steve was saying earlier around providing information as a way of putting in place collaborations and reducing duplication. And also what Alex was saying around just having a community of practice to facilitate connecting between different institutions and people. And we're aiming to do that really by providing the features that we just heard about and which you can see in the middle box on the screen in front of you, which include, just to summarize, a visualization of funding flows as well as opportunities, uh, now casting and forecasting of what activities and projects are underway or will require funding in specific countries, the provision of donor, country, as well as project information and profiles, community features and a space for good practice exchange among users, and of course, a repository of key resources to help advocate and make a stronger business case for funding data. And all of this information will cover the major bilateral as well as multilateral aid providers and philanthropic donors, and on the demand side, all 74 IDA eligible countries. And of course, the aim of all of this to tie to the theme of today's webinar is really to facilitate coordination and also achieve better alignment between the country priorities and funding and projects that are implemented with development uh, cooperation providers. Now, what will this look like in practice? Um, I'm going to show you now very briefly a couple of mock-ups to give you an idea of what it will be like to use the platform. This is subject to change, but it really can give you a sense of what kind of information and use you can make out of this tool. So the first mock-up you can see here is of the funding flows page, which is where a user, where you can find information on the amount of funding for data and statistics going into a specific country, which in this case is Rwanda, uh, as well as the source of this funding. So is it bilateral, multilateral, et cetera, uh, and also a breakdown by policy area. Uh, and by the way, the data you see on the mock-ups is dummy data, so please do bear that in mind. And as a user, you can also for, um, find, if you were to scroll down on this page, information on the major donors operating at the country level, as well as look at what kind of activities will be funded by them in the future, which can help different project partners, for example, better plan investments. And this information can be found not only at the country level, as you can see here, but also at the regional and global level. So you can zoom in and out in terms of granularity. And of course, you will have information and access to information also on the funding needs for countries, which here again, you can see an example of. So when you go on the funding needs page, you will be able to see the funding status, for instance, of the government's different statistical and data strategies, which are exemplified in this case by the traffic lights you can see at the top. And of course, you'll also be able to see an overview of the planned statistical activities um, for, uh, on the country level uh, for the coming years as well as other priorities at the country level. So these are just two examples, but of course we'll have more uh, pages and functionalities relating to the community fe features I mentioned earlier that we haven't shown here. So I hope, however, that this gives you a sense of what it will be like to utilize the platform. Now, where do things stand in terms of the practical development of the project? 
Uh, I'd like to give you a few updates here as honing in on the data sourcing, which I'll hand over to Julie for, um, and to give you a sense of what's coming next. So as I mentioned earlier, we are actively working to launch the prototype of this platform with all the features that you heard about earlier uh, at the UN World Data Forum this October 2021. And to this end, we've been moving forward, um, especially along three pillars. So the first is platform design. So that's the website, uh, which is well underway, and we'll be launching a test of this with a small group of users this summer. Of course, in parallel, we've been working to establish partnerships and synergies and uh, linkages with existing databases, initiatives, and other work streams to really make sure we're building on existing resources and we're not building anything that is duplicative. And in this process, we've also been very actively sourcing user stories from different potential users to understand how this can help different institutions, different user groups in their work. So we would love to hear from you as well if you're interested and to help develop a user case on this for the on your institution for the clearinghouse. And last but not least, of course, we've been working on making sure we have the data necessary and the modeling to deliver the ambitious functionalities I presented earlier. So to just deep dive a little bit on that before we close, I'd like to give the floor to Julia to walk us through the data sourcing and then we can conclude on the next steps. Julia, over to you. Thanks, Jure. Thanks, Jure. Uh, thanks so, uh, much, thanks so for much for the introduction. And um, yeah, let us go a bit more into the details of the technical aspects of data sourcing. As Dre has pointed out, it's a very ambitious project and we want to make sure that we have the right data and also leverage data that is already existing in, in the community. So in order to, to do that, we have really spent the past six months on conducting a detailed data audit to inform the data sourcing approach and understand what data is already there, where the data gaps that we, we are looking at, specifically with both the now casting and the forecasting that we intend to implement, and also the question about what can we actually model or what needs to be modeled. So what we came up with is a more developed data sourcing strategy that we're also happy to share and um, happy to, to have more detailed questions on that. Um, to create linkages with the existing databases and collect new data for the October project prototype. Um, I will talk about the different data categories in a second, but most importantly, the principles behind the data sourcing is really to utilize as much as possible data that's already out there. Um, and we have started really dialogues and discussions with big partners from the Burn Network to Leverage Synergies on bringing together data sources that have been already um, inside organizations, but not yet up, uh, published uh, for the public. And then we want to, for the new information, we want to collect specifically with the forward-looking information on the financing needs. We want to limit the reporting burden as much as possible on information providers. So if you could quickly just have a quick look at, yeah, thanks. So that's what, what we try to do um, in a nutshell. Um, you see that we have three different data categories, data that is available and accessible that we all know from the credit reporting system, for example, or the World Bank that is mostly processed and used. Um, then we have data that is available but not accessible, for example, m and &E data or internal project level data that we intend to publish, where we are already having discussions on how to share those data most appropriately and repurpose it. And then a smaller share of the data that is not available nor accessible, which we we are looking basically into the future NSO funding needs. And we talk about the time horizon of the next five years where we, we don't know so much about it in a formalized standardized manner. And for that, we will use what we call the data validation mechanism. Um, can we quickly go to the last slide? Yeah. So that means if we connect it back to the mockups that um, Jure introduced, we have basically um, parts of the platform that will look into tracking funding flows, which is what we mean when we look at supply. That is, as I said, sourcing in mostly the accessible data, collecting previously non-existing accessible data to some extent, and looking at domestic financing flows. So what we currently do is, for example, extracting data from NSDS budget tables, but also sectoral plans um, to understand what was the domestic budget in the past. And that links to the exploring of funding opportunities, which we call the demand side, where there's like, what are the future needs? What are the express demands? What has what has been put out there, but there's no funding yet to really pursue the strategic activity. So for that, we equally look into um, 
national development plans, sector planning, but we also need to collect new data. And this is not only the expressed demand, but also links to the latent demand, which we um, which we aim to do a very short um, assessment of what are the modernization needs, digitalization needs, and um, and really also gather the a, a thorough understanding of the financing ecosystem in the country itself from demonstrable cases um, and, and really project level data information. So overall, I think it's key to conclude the partnerships with both the development providers, the international organizations, the statistical community, but also the recipient countries are key to make this work. And I'm happy to answer any any further questions on those um, technical details. Thanks. Back to Jurei. Thanks, Julia. And really to just wrap up, we'd love to hear from you if you have any suggestions, if you want to explore our use case um, or use story. So please do get in touch. Your, the email is on the screen and we have an exciting journey ahead of us to the World Data Forum this year, but also beyond. So we look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you so much, Jury and Julia, for your presentation and the mock-up today, which I believe are really um, informative for us. So I see we still have uh, seven minutes for the webinar, and uh, I guess you might uh, went a little bit over time, so please bear with us. And again, we will upload the recording and the slide deck to the global network later. So please watch it later if you cannot stay longer. So now we move to our Q&A section. And I see there are uh, questions posted in the chat. I'm going to read it and uh, please feel free to also raise your hands on the Teams anytime if you would like to ask the question yourself. So the first question, I guess, is for uh, Stephen. So uh, the first question is, where can we find the contact list of the data and the statistics focal point for UN country teams? Okay, so uh, we maintain a list for the contact points in the UNECE region. And uh, although we can't, uh, I don't think we can really publish that with uh, all of the email addresses, etc. Uh, if anybody needs uh, the contacts for the UNECE region, then please contact me, uh, Stephen Vale at un.org. Uh, but I do believe that UNSD is compiling a global list. Uh, which may be more useful for certain purposes. So I don't know if anybody in UNSD knows anything more about that. Uh, maybe I can just add on that. So yes, we have a list, maybe not a complete list, but a pretty good list of the um, data officers and economists in the resident coordinator offices um, but again also we cannot share the full list just publicly but so if you need to contact somebody specifically please reach out to us and we can try to put you in contact otherwise you can always reach out to the resident coordinator office of a specific country directly and they for sure will put you in contact with the right person over to you okay thank you both and the second question is also for Steve. So how do you coordinate corp, uh, capacity building activities for country members of UNCE and the UNSCAP? And should one not propose UNSD to participant or um, at least a report to the group since we are all directly involved in the region? Over to you. OK, so the coordination with UNSCAP uh, well, they are also a member of the group. So for the, I think it's eight or nine countries that are overlapping between our region and theirs, then we, we automatically have the coordination through the group. Uh, UNSD would be very welcome. The main challenge would be time zones uh, because our group stretching into Central Asia, uh, as it does, we have the meetings quite early uh, Geneva time, which means they would be very, very early New York time. So uh, would be a bit of a challenge. Maybe somebody in uh, New York would have to get up at about three in the morning or so to join. So uh, apart from that, of course, there's no reason why uh, UNSD uh, shouldn't be involved, though. So uh, no problem if you want to be. That's great. <coughs> Thank you. And the next question, I think, is for um, uh, Jury and uh, Julia. So the um, so, so first question is very short. So when is the target date for the portal to go live? 
Thanks. Um, so it is, it's, it's October 2021. We were aiming to do a bit of a preview in the summer, so we're happy to keep you all posted. Um, also, if you're looking to join the Burn Network, it's a very informal network. You get updates here and there, so we're happy to add you to the list. So I'll input our email addresses in the chat and you can always reach out to us. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, the next question, I guess, is a little bit more technical. So where do you get the data? I guess Shelly is meant the data in the clearing house. So please uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I guess this is for Julie. Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. So thanks for the question. Um, as we try to um, show in this quick overview slide, and it's definitely not enough time to go into depth on that, we have three different categories of data. Some of that is the data is coming from the creditor reporting system, YATI, um, what we call our press data that is already existing. Then there is a bunch of data that we look into collaborations with other um, actors, such like Development Gateway, the World Bank, UNSD, that is more like the, the second category of data. And then there is a new data um, that we look to source in, very minor share of that. And we are currently looking into um, synergies of how to collaborate on potential surveys. Um, that That is where the data is coming from. And I'm happy to share the development, the, the this data strategy that explains that in way more detail with you, if you're interested. Thank you. <clears throat> and also, I see the chat. Um, uh, one, one question from the chat that this is an uh, excellent tool, Jury and Julia. And is there also a way to channel needs for technical assistance that is not related to the finance advisory uh, services? Great question. I think, Julia, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I think the short answer is yes, we aim to assess as well the non financial um, technical assistance that is planned or has not yet occurred. Sounds great. So I see we have one minute left, so uh, I'm not sure if anyone wants to raise your hands to uh, ask a question yourself. Um, otherwise, I can uh, read one more question from the chat. Alex, do you see any uh, hands up? No? OK. So the next question I think is also for Julie and Julia. So how is the data collection planned to be sustained? Should I take that, Julie? I'm just yeah, yeah, happy to 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 say. So the idea is to do that on an um, it depends again on the data category, but in general the idea is to do it on an annual basis, and the idea is to gradually go from us sourcing and data to actually countries submit or. Uh, partners that are users that are using the clearinghouse submitting their data to us. And if you look into a long term horizon of five years, for example, so there would be a decentralized data sourcing, if that makes sense. Um, again, happy to share more information on that later. Sounds great. Yes, I, I see um, Drury also put, put the email address in the chat, so please feel free to reach out to them if you have any further question. And also, uh, we encourage you to join our global network of data officers and citizens for um, further discussion. And if you have any further question, or I see um, there are a couple of questions that we cannot answer due to the time stream. Um, so you are encouraged to uh, continue ask the question on the global network. And uh, at this time, I would say thank you very much for uh, giving us the presentation and also thank you all for joining us the, the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Join yep. us again next time, next week. Next week, yeah. Next week, we will have another Global Network web webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. Thank you so much for the organization. It was a really real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Julia.